About 30 miles south of San Francisco, in the heart of Silicon Valley, a long, low, beige-colored building runs under the busy artery of Highway 280. From underneath the overpass, it stretches off into the distance in either direction, about as far as the eye can see. The building is buzzing. That's because it's no ordinary building. It's a laser. Well, part of a laser. The massive two-mile-long facility is known as the LCLS, short for Linac Coherent Light Source, but you don't need to remember that. All you need to know is that it can generate one of the brightest and fastest X-ray lasers in the world. There, on the campus of the U.S. Department of Energy's SLAC National Accelerator Laboratory, scientists are probing some of the most extreme research scenarios in science, from peering inside the core of planets to creating incredible slow-motion movies of the coronavirus binding to the proteins of our cells. And with a decade-long upgrade underway, the LCLS is getting even more powerful. We're talking thousands of times faster and brighter, making the research possibilities essentially limitless. This is Direct Current, an Energy.gov podcast. I'm your host, Matt Dozier. Coming up, we'll dive into the world of ultra-fast, ultra-small science. A world where diamonds fall like rain, molecules move like ballet dancers, and the line between physics and chemistry starts to blur. Stay tuned. It's science for the people. This is Direct Current. SLAC, that's spelled S-L-A-C, all caps, is one of the Energy Department's 17 national laboratories. Nestled alongside Stanford University in Palo Alto, California, the lab and university have a close shared history. SLAC originally stood for Stanford Linear Accelerator Center before the lab's official name changed to SLAC National Accelerator Laboratory in 2008. Today, Stanford operates SLAC on behalf of the department's Office of Science. LCLS is a user facility with a long wait list for the scientists flocking from around the world to Palo Alto to take a turn at focusing its intense X-ray beams on their samples, everything from rare crystalline structures to the enzymes in the leaves of plants. To understand what the LCLS can do, first we need to know a little bit more about what an X-ray laser is. There's two things going on here, both of which should be pretty familiar. X-rays, like the one your doctor uses when you break a bone, and lasers, which we all know what lasers are, right? Intense beams of super-focused light. Lasers come in all shapes and sizes. You've got your laser pointer that drives the cat crazy. You've got your laser used for eye surgery. You've got your James Bond conveyor belt death laser. The LCLS doesn't look like any of those. You can't even really see the laser itself. You can see parts of it from ground level, like the buzzing building I mentioned at the start of the episode. The actual guts of the laser run underneath that, about three stories down, through a two-mile-long underground tunnel housing a linear accelerator, or LINAC for short. That's the first L in LCLS. The inner workings of the LCLS are fairly convoluted, so I'll spare you some of the details. But it all starts with a really, really bright flash of ultraviolet light, the same wavelength that gives you a sunburn. That light strikes a copper plate, releasing a burst of electrons. The electrons get channeled into a particle accelerator, which is where the real power of this machine kicks in. The accelerator for the LCLS uses a copper pipe that runs the length of the two-mile-long tunnel. Standing at one end of it, it's hard to see the other. A sign on the wall reads speed limit, 10 miles per hour, but that's just for work vehicles. The only limit to how fast the electrons can go is set by physics. 25 feet up, at ground level, that buzzing building is filled with microwave generators called klystrons. Intense microwave pulses from the klystrons push the electrons in the accelerator tube to 99.9999999% of the speed of light. As they travel down the tube, they pass rows and rows of magnets, thousands in total. The magnets wiggle the electrons back and forth, causing them to emit x-rays. Further down the tunnel, additional hardware focuses the X-rays into a coherent beam that's one of the most powerful sources of X-ray light in the world. A billion times brighter, in fact, than the ones that came before it. So there you have it. One super-fast, super-bright X-ray laser, courtesy of the LCLS. So what can you do with it? The LCLS, when it was brought online back in 2009 uh, as a DOE user facility, they planned for the use of this super bright X-ray source to study the ultra-small on the ultra-fast. That's Mike Minitti, senior staff scientist at SLAC and the department head for the LCLS's soft X-rays. 
which is psi slang for the lower energy x-rays the machine produces. And the combination of these two aspects of very, very bright x-rays coming in very small slivers, fast frame rates of time, this millionth of a billionth of a second, and it's called a femtosecond, this machine was the first of its kind to marry those two unique aspects. Let's go back to the doctor's office example. You know how when you break your arm, the x-ray machine takes a picture of it? Well, the LCLS essentially does that, but it can do it 120 times a second, zoomed all the way down to the molecular level. So instead of a single snapshot of a fractured bone, you can create a movie of chemical changes happening in slow motion. And that's pretty cool. But it's not the only thing that makes the LCLS uniquely suited for capturing ultra-precise images. You heard Mike mention femtoseconds. That's one quadrillionth of a second, or a millionth of a billionth of a second. That's how fast the shutter of the LCLS's X-ray camera can fire. So things that happen in a fraction of a blink of an eye can be captured with perfect clarity. It's kind of hard to fathom the level of engineering precision it takes to maintain such perfect timing. But Slack's team of accelerator physicists and technicians have gotten pretty comfortable working in the world of femtoseconds. The engineering challenges on this thing are quite amazing. The tolerances to keep everything so perfectly aligned on this micron level over hundreds and hundreds of meters, it's so precise that in our early running days, we noticed the beam performance was better during the day or better during the night. And basically, we had to account for the gravitational pull of the moon. Really? <laughs> Down at the far end of the accelerator tunnel, there are two experimental hubs where scientists from around the world gather in a rabbit warren of research stations to put the laser to use. To get down to the majority of these experimental stations, you enter a metal doorway surrounded by concrete that's buried in the side of a hill. It's kind of like an industrial hobbit hole. A sign reading LCLS FEH in red letters pokes up above the door. That's Far Experimental Hall. Just like a bus station, it's kind of where we deliver these x-rays to specific scientifically tuned experimental apparatus. And each of them have a specific purpose. Some are built to look at the structure of crystals and biological samples in a single shot. The others are also then to do spectroscopy in a wavelength regime called soft x-rays, looking at how electrons and energy flows through material on a very fast time scale. Others also then look at fundamental interactions of x-rays with simplistic molecules. How does this x-ray energy radiate and transfer through and create a chemical change that we can clock? Mike gave me a tour of the facility a while back. Down there in the subterranean laboratory, the various research stations are secured with sturdy-looking shielded doors and meticulously color-coded by experiment. Red, yellow, purple, and so on. Well, the lead instrument scientists for each of these end stations, they got to choose their hutch color. And they're all color-coded, their tools are color-coded and things like this. Uh, it is very tribal, but when push comes to sub, it definitely is a team effort. We're here to get the science done. The work done in these underground stations has led to breakthroughs in chemistry, physics, and biology. One of Slack's specialties is creating molecular movies that show atoms moving in real time through the workings of biology. Researchers at the LCLS have captured the most detailed images of the process of photosynthesis, where plants split water into hydrogen and oxygen. Much of the research also has medical and environmental applications. Some scientists have used it to decode the structures of proteins. Other studies have examined materials for better computer chips, the particles in air pollution, and supercooled water. This brings us to another marquee feature of the LCLS. LCLS's x-rays are so intense, and they come in this tiny, tiny sliver of time, this femtosecond, this millionth of a billionth of a second. The interaction of the x-rays to the sample happens so quickly that it outruns the damage incurred by the x-rays passing through it. A lot of the research targets we just talked about, plant cells, proteins, delicate crystals, unstable chemical phases, don't react well to being barbecued by a giant laser. They don't last, and so uh, these poor little uh, biological samples are just annihilated. Uh, <laughs> but we get all the relevant information, six orders of magnitude in time, you know, sooner than they blow up. The lightning-fast pulse of the LCLS means that by the time the fragile sample starts to disintegrate, nanoseconds later, the scientists have long since learned everything they needed to know. Being able to capture the data before the x-rays destroy the samples makes a huge difference. Researchers knowing that they can see the samples as they really are, unaffected by the imaging process, helps them get data that's useful in the real world. On the other hand, some of the scientists want to see their samples get destroyed. In fact, that's why they're studying them. So my main interest is studying how materials behave at extreme conditions. So the conditions I mean 
are really high pressures and temperatures like you'd find within the cores of planets in particular. Dr. Emma McBride is a researcher at SLAC with a focus on pushing materials to their furthest limits. So it's got applications for fusion, so for clean energy. But for me, what I'm mainly interested in is what happens to an atom when you put in so much energy through compressing it that you can change how it bonds or even change the atom itself. Geological formations in her home country of Northern Ireland sparked her interest in this area. In particular, the Giant's Causeway, a landscape of stone columns, made her wonder what was going on underneath the surface. What I learned in school was that these weird geologic formations formed either in the crust of the earth or on the surface from magma in the mantle of the earth pushing up. But I was always wondering what was actually happening in the mantle or further below it. And the astounding thing is that we have no way to go and probe it directly. Like We can't reach the centre of the Earth just by digging or something because it's far too hot. So we have to mimic these conditions in the lab. Emma uses the LCLS's Matter in Extreme Conditions experimental station. Wires, tubes, computers and storage cabinets run along the walls of the large room, painted a deep yellow colour. A narrow metal tube runs from the adjacent room into a silver cylinder. This brings the precious x-rays into the station. But before the x-rays can come into play, the scientists need to create those extreme conditions for their experiment. The solution? Even more lasers. They shoot extremely fast, short pulses of green light at samples such as silicon. It forms a plasma, like the matter that makes up the sun. The sample's atoms start expanding outward. To create the right conditions, they then shoot a wave that creates extremely high pressures and compresses the plasma. Emma explains further. The shock wave we're creating creates pressure and temperature conditions that last for around a nanosecond, so a billionth of a second. But the LCLS produces x-rays that last for a millionth of a billionth of a second, which allows you to really freeze and capture this state. This reveals all sorts of useful insights, both for materials here on Earth and beyond. Because silicon is used in semiconductors, how it responds to stress can provide information to tech companies. Creating metallic hydrogen could be a major discovery, with the potential to be a room temperature superconductor that transfers energy super efficiently. This research can also result in things that sound like science fiction. We're also interested in larger planets, like Neptune, where inside Neptune we've recently discovered that in the mantle of this planet they have a lot of methane so a lot of carbon and hydrogen bonded together. And we've discovered if you compress it to just the right conditions of pressure and temperature, the carbon and hydrogen separate, and then you get the carbon crystallizing into diamond. And so diamonds form inside these large planets and fall towards the centre under gravity. So you can think of it like there's diamond rain happening inside Neptune, which is just crazy. But using the LCLS, we saw this happening for a few nanoseconds, but we saw it. (laughs) That's right. Diamond rain. You really can't make this stuff up. And you definitely won't catch a glimpse of it without a machine as powerful as the LCLS. We're taking snapshots that are faster than the atoms can actually rearrange themselves. So that's really cool. This has resulted in a few surprises. I think everything almost that we've done with the LCLS has come as a big surprise and that's that's what's so amazing about this facility where you have x-rays that are so bright in such a short space of time that you can really probe exactly where the atoms are in your structure. But not every surprise has been a pleasant one. It's a pretty extreme environment we create. So all these experiments are conducted in a large vacuum chamber with very energetic lasers. And so it's it's hard enough to provide the x-rays, but then we also generate some x-rays by our lasers interacting with the target. That can totally swamp your signal, and it can also generate an electromagnetic pulse which knocks out all your detectors, (laughs) so... In fact, the first time they ran experiments at the Matter in Extreme Conditions Hutch, the scientists were in for quite a shock. Experiments at previous facilities used image plates to take data, like photographic film. The lasers didn't affect them. In contrast, the sensors at the LCLS were a bit more sensitive. Our detectors were electronic, so the very first shot we did blew one of them up, which was very upsetting, as you can imagine. (laughs) But, you know, we figured out how to get around that, thankfully. It was almost a very painful lesson. 
The detector group, I think, are magicians. They managed to bring it back to life after many months. But considering we had maybe four days of the experiment, it was a little soul-destroying to realize we did that to ourselves on day one. As Mike Manitti rightly points out, the LCLS is still an incredibly capable machine. But that doesn't mean the Slack Lab team is content to leave it that way. We've had a really great success here as a user facility delivering this great x-ray science with an accelerator that's 60 plus years old. We've done a great job with that. Uh, but then in, in order to take that next quantum leap in free electron x-ray science is to take that source that we have now, still use it, we'll still have that capability, but we're going to take it to the next level. Allow me to introduce LCLS2. For all of 2019 and the first few months of 2020, the facility shut down for a total overhaul, funded by the Department of Energy's Office of Science. Here's Mike Dunn, director of the LCLS, to walk us through the renovations. So what was happening there was two or three major things. You know, so one major thing was ripping out the first third of our accelerator tunnel. About a kilometer worth of accelerator was taken out and a whole new system put in. So this goes from sort of 1960s technology you know, using copper pipes and you know, able to get 100 pulses a second to superconducting cryogenic technology that lets us scale all the way up to these million pulses per second. The new supercooled model is going to be kept chilled to two degrees above absolute zero for truly extreme speed. So there's a big cryogenic refrigeration plant. You know, that's the size of a uh, supermarket you know, that sits next door to the accelerator now. We've got these new superconducting cryogenic uh, modules in the accelerator tunnel. So that was underway, still underway now. The reason we have to shut down was because the, the heart of LCLS, which is this so-called undulator, this set of magnets that converts electron energy into x-rays, uh, we had to rip all of that out and to put in a new system. So that took many months of extraction and installation. And at the same time, we completely reconfigured our experimental hall where the instruments live to be able to put in these new instruments that again can take full advantage of the high repetition rate. I spoke to Mike after the newly revamped LCLS restarted in spring 2020, after the team battled through weeks of delays and uncertainty to safely reopen the facility during California's first wave of COVID-19. And there was a good reason for their urgency. When we had to be putting the facility back together again over the past few months, you know, recommissioning it, the fact that we were doing so in our first experiments will be looking at the coronavirus itself. And it was an incredibly motivating factor for all of us. When the LCLS came back online, its very first target was one of the key proteins the coronavirus uses to invade our cells. We spent the first few days taking images of the main protease of the coronavirus and looking at how it bonds onto various drug targets for antiviral drugs and compounds, you know, looking at their 3D structure at the atomic level. You know, taking thousands and thousands and thousands of images to get you know, really down to atomic level information of uh, the protease itself and all of these different drug targets. So this protein, which is called the main protease, is kind of like a molecular scissor. That's Dr. Hassan Demirsi. He was principal investigator on the initial research using the LCLS to examine that molecular scissor. Hassan had spent seven years as a researcher at SLAC before relocating to Turkey to head a new lab focused on the 3D structure of molecules in biology. I moved to Istanbul Koç University in August 2019, and then the COVID started in December. So I had to build a lab in the middle of a perfect storm from scratch. All right, so... That was absolutely like the worst thing can happen, right? Instead of putting everything on hold, Hassan and his students set out to address the urgent need for more data on potential coronavirus treatments. Except the best place to do that research was one of the hottest tickets in the scientific world. It kind of like brought an opportunity alongside because a young PI like me should have wait maybe like maybe five years to get to a point where you can, you know, receive that precious beam time at LCLS, right? It, it's like a hot, hot, hot light source. Everybody wants to do experiments there. And I just moved to Turkey. How am I going to get that chance of executing an experiment at LCLS? It's a dream, right? That chance came a lot sooner than he expected. Between his Slack connection and experience working on biological molecules, like virus proteins, for instance, Hassan's new lab was perfectly positioned to lead the charge on studying the coronavirus using the newly upgraded LCLS. 
perfect, except for the 10-hour time difference and nearly 7,000 miles between Istanbul and Palo Alto. It's an absolute jet lag. So I think moving into the beam time was an absolute inferno. Like, it, it was just a hell, right? So the whole campus is closed. The only cars parked outside was my car. It's past midnight. We rarely got any sleep for, like, going into the beam time. Like, the two, three months, we basically just, like, worked around the clock just to get those samples ready. To get the samples from his university to Slack, Hassan's team first needed to grow the delicate protein crystals in the lab, soak them with the drugs they wanted to test, and ship them halfway around the world without freezing them, which would compromise the fragile structures. Rather than go high-tech to protect their precious cargo, they used something simple, plentiful, and distinctively Turkish. Lots and lots of cotton. So we grow these crystals here, and then we wrap them with organic Turkish cottons, wrap it again and again and again, like we have two grams of sample, two kilogram of cotton, just to insulate these samples so like when they travel, they don't get exposed to these like temperature fluctuations, so they, they don't lose their quality. And we just hope for the best, and we prayed a lot, and our samples arrived to LCLS, and now we're waiting for the beam time. We're waiting and waiting and waiting, and then the day comes, right? We put our crystals, and I said, oh, are they going to defrag? Like, are we going to see anything? What they saw exceeded their wildest expectations. It was amazing. It was absolutely amazing. Stunning diffractions, absolutely gorgeous data, and then... The best part of it is that, you know, once the samples arrived to LCLS, it was no different than being on site because the people at LCLS, they did a fantastic job. It was just like seamless data collection, seamless interfaces. So for us, whether I was in Turkey or I was at Slack, didn't make a bit of difference. With the newly revamped X-ray laser operating flawlessly, the team collected an avalanche of data on the coronavirus main protease in a short span of time, painting a clearer picture than ever before of the virus's molecular scissors at room temperature. I asked Hassan about the pressure of being the first team to test out the LCLS after its long hiatus, especially with so much writing on his research. Somebody who doesn't know LCLS could have think that they were the guinea pigs, right? Because you're the first one, everything is up. But I know these people, right? I, I, I work with them for over many years, and I know how perfectionist they are. Being first was like an absolute privilege for us. So young people, most of them have no LCLS experience. I, I think, you know, seeing the trust on the other side put into my group, it was like an absolute privilege and honor. Some of LCLS 2's advanced capabilities are still a few years down the road. But on day one of the restart, the machine was already firing on a new wavelength, enabling its x-rays to create images that are even more detailed than before. So that's the first step, being able to push to much higher energies to get that higher resolution. The second step that's happening, which will come about uh, in the next couple of years, is a factor of a few thousand increase in our x-ray power. We go from where we are today, which is about 120 x-ray pulses per second that the machine delivers, up to a million pulses per second. That's a factor of 8,000. Most exciting of all, perhaps, is that the machine's shutter speed, as we've been referring to it, has gotten even faster. So fast, in fact, that Mike Dunn and his colleagues are leaving the world of femtoseconds behind. There's a particular so worldwide unique capability that we want to turn on first, which is going to even shorter time durations. You know, so we currently live in this femtosecond world. Turns out, you know, uh, the step faster than a femtosecond is called an attosecond. An attosecond? An attosecond, yeah, A T T O, an attosecond. And, and, you know, and you think, well, why is that important? Well, it turns out, yeah, femtoseconds are useful for looking at chemistry and you know, quantum materials. And uh, Emma McBride will have talked about replicating the conditions on the gas giant planets, you know, here on Earth. And all of, all of those, that, that chemistry and material science evolves on a femtosecond timescale. But if you really want to look at the initiating events of chemistry, when does physics turn into chemistry? When does the motion of the electrons really start to move charge, pull those atoms around? That happens on about a one femtosecond or a fraction of a femtosecond timescale. So what we call attoseconds. So if you really want to capture that initiation of chemistry, for example, if you're trying to capture uh, sunlight and convert it into energy, you want to capture that flow of electrons through a molecule, then you need to look on this attosecond timescale. While the LCLS has enabled scientists to do so much already, LCLS 2 will allow them to do even more. Much more. For Emma McBride, it means that she and her colleagues can bring those materials to even more extreme conditions. They can get more information than ever on what happens if they compress these samples to ever higher pressures. 
The LCLS2 will also help her get more data per experimental run, which is more efficient. So instead of, as I said, waiting 10 minutes for one shot to the next and then hoping that your laser and your target all behave the same, we'd be able to do a whole experiment, like four different X-ray measurements in the space of five nanoseconds. So that's huge. That's what I'm very excited about. And for Hassan Demirsi, the prospect of an 8,000-fold increase in LCLS's X-ray power is positively mouthwatering. We're still processing the data, like so much data. This was like LCLS at 120 hertz, and now the next chapter is going to be like 1 million image per second. So there's going to be more data, more signs, more discoveries. I mean, what we've seen is like an indication of what the future is going to be. It's like absolutely bright, absolutely amazing. So I can't wait to see what the real LCLS operating at 1 million image per second. So that, that's going to be an absolute beast. Getting ready for a leap of this magnitude isn't just a matter of installing some new hardware, although that's a big part of it. You also need to figure out just how you're going to handle the astronomical increase in the amount of data LCLS2 is going to produce. The march of uh, data science, you make use of artificial intelligence, machine learning, to process that data ever and ever faster is just as important as actually building this accelerator. So, uh, so having these few years of installation actually gives us the, the window of opportunity to build up these supercomputers, build up the data systems, build up the analysis techniques that then have knock-on impact on self-driving cars and all, all kind of stuff across you know, other areas. So. You, don't, you don't do anything in a small way, do you? No, this truly is. Every bit of the, uh, the technology has to take these massive leaps. You know, when, when LCLS first turned on a decade ago, it was a, a leap of a billion times in brightness. You know, normally in science, you take you know, a leap of a factor two or three or maybe 10 if you're lucky. You know, that was a leap of a billion. And so the whole world had to transform to figure out how to deal with that. And now we're going through another leap of about 10,000 in a way that taxes every single other part of the system. You know, the computers, the data systems, the laser systems, the detectors. And so you, you've got to push the state of the art well beyond where it is now in order to be able to cope. For many scientific institutions, juggling all these different challenges simultaneously would be unthinkable. There's just so much that needs to happen in perfect coordination on such a grand scale that it's hard to even wrap your brain around it. But for Mike Dunn and his colleagues across the Department of Energy and our 17 national labs, tackling big science projects, whether that's a massive underground neutrino detector, the nuclear battery for a Mars rover, or the world's brightest X-ray laser, it's just what they do. I mean, I think this is why national labs exist, to be able to bring together a whole wide range of different capabilities, whether it be modeling on a computer, whether it be the kind of data we can take using X-rays. And then, you know, pull that together to tackle some critical societal issue of the day. That's why I'm particularly proud to work at the National Lab, because you know you can have the capability to tackle some of these really, really important problems. That's all for this episode of Direct Current. If you want to dive deeper into the ultra-small, ultra-fast world of Slack Labs X-ray science, we've got photos, videos, links, and more on our episode page, which you can find at energy.gov slash podcast. Thank you so, so much to the folks at Slack who shared their time and energy to make this episode possible, all while working on the big LCLS2 upgrade project. In particular, I'd like to thank my guests, Hassan Demirsi, Mike Minitti, Emma McBride, and Mike Dunn, and the rest of the Slack communications team for their assistance. Thanks as well to Shannon Shea in our Office of Science, who was a big help on the script for this episode. If you've got a question about this episode or want to leave us some feedback, email us at directcurrent at hq.doe.gov or tweet at energy. And if you're enjoying the show, share it with a friend and leave us a review on Apple Podcasts. Direct Current is produced by me, Matt Dozier. Sarah Harmon creates original artwork for all of our episodes. This is a production of the U.S. Department of Energy and published from our nation's capital in Washington, D.C. Thanks for listening.